Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Dr. Stein, for the introduction and thank you for the SSAT for the opportunity to present our work today. I have nothing to disclose. Um, due to the close anatomical relationship between the superior mesenteric vein or the portal vein and the posterior neck of the pancreas, uh, venous involvement uh, by a tumor or by inflammatory adhesions is not uncommon. So initially and historically, portal vein involvement was considered uh, the sign of an advanced and unresectable disease. Fortner in 1984 was the first to describe a regional pancreatectomy with end block resection of the portal vein, uh, regardless of portal, of portal vein involvement. This procedure was shortly after uh, abandoned due to the high mortality and with very minimal benefit in survival. Uh, from the 80s all the way to the year 2000s, the concept of portal vein resection during pancreatectomy was refined from a better knowledge of the indication for portal vein resection with the Ishikawa classification in 92 to uh, proving that portal vein resection was safe in 96. Uh, and this led finally to the expert consensus from Evans and colleagues in 2009, promoting venous resection as a standard of care in order to achieve uh, negative margins. I apologize. Um, so the current indication for portal vein resection during pancreatectomy can be divided into four main cardinal categories. Venous resection is most of the time planned preoperatively pre based on cross-sectional imaging studies. Uh, in a minority of patients, uh, though, it is decided intraoperatively after a venous uh, injury. Venous resection can also be indicated in benign disease such as chronic pancreatitis, pancreatic cyst, or pancreatic pseudocyst due to posterior inflammatory adhesions, and it can be uh, indicated for, uh, because of the malignancy as defined by the 2020 NCCN guidelines defining borderline resectable pancreatic cancer. Although venous resection uh, during pancreat pancreatectomy is safe in experienced center, it is associated with potentially severe complication. On top of those, uh, portal vein thrombosis has been described in up to 30% of patients. And although most patients remain asymptomatic in the acute or even in the chronic phase, portal vein thrombosis may be acutely uh, associated with mesenteric congestion, mesenteric ischemia, or chronically can be associated with portal hypertension and liver failure with the symptoms described on the right. As the risk of superior mesenteric or portal vein thrombosis after resection and reconstruction during pancreatectomy remains unclear, our study aimed to describe the prevalence and risk factors of portal vein thrombosis. From 2007 to 2019, all consecutive patients who underwent uh, portal vein resection during pancreatectomy at a single academic center were included in our study. Uh, we, uh, our primary outcome was the prevalence of post-operative portal vein thrombosis. The secondary outcomes were the risk factors associated with that thrombosis, and we uh, utilized standard statistics with univariate and multivariate analysis. We created Kaplan-Mayer curves to study the patency rates. Uh, all surgical procedures were performed with curative intent by a team of surgeons uh, with significant pancreatic experience. Four types of venous reconstruction were uh, used. The first one was venorafi, patch was very seldom used. Uh, second type of reconstruction was primary end-to-end -end anastomosis. Third type was an, uh, the use of an interposition graft, whether it was an autologous vein or a prosthetic graft. Of the 2,700 patients who underwent pancreatic resection during the study period, 220 patients underwent portal vein resection. 
The sex ratio was close to one with a mean age of 65 years, a median follow-up of 175 days. The main indication for portomain resection was malignancy in 92%, and uh, the most commonly uh, used surgery was a Whipple in 82%. Uh, of the 220 patients with venous resection, 16% or 36 patients develop a thrombosis postoperatively after a median uh, time of 15 to 16 days. And interestingly, 6% of thrombosis were developed during the first week postoperatively. The median operative time uh, for the cohort was 381 minutes with a median EBL of 800 cc uh, and a median clump time for reconstruction of 21 minutes. Mortality was 6.8% with a morbidity of 47% and a median length of, say, of nine days. So four types of venous reconstruction were used as I described prior, venorafi in 18%, primary end-to-end -end anastomosis in 65%, 14% of our cohort required an autologous uh, vein graft with the IJ being the most commonly used, and 3% required a prosthetic graft with PTFE being the most common used. The uh, median uh, venous clamp time, as expected, was longer when the patient required a graft versus a venorathy or primary end to end anastomosis. So there was a significant difference in the rate of thrombosis according to the type of reconstruction. And uh, with 13% of thrombosis with venorafi or end-to-end -end estimosis versus 23% when an autologous vein was used and 83% when a synthetic graft was used. As shown on the Kaplan-Meier curve on the left side, uh, the patency rate after reconstruction were excellent. It was 93% at one month, 89% uh, at three months. And when patency rates were uh, divided, were broken down by the type of reconstruction, uh, reconstruction with a prosthetic graft had the least uh, good outcome and the worst patency rates. Uh, now, portamine thrombosis was associated with an increased 30-day uh, mortality overall complication in next of stay. However, it was not statistically significant in multivariate analysis. I apologize for the technical issues. No problem, take your time. Uh, in multivariate, and I, I showed that table and it does not include all the, the criteria that we included in our multivariate analysis, but I thought it was a better view uh, and it was clearer. Uh, but in multivariate analysis, patients with thrombosis were uh, not significantly different from patients without thrombosis in terms of demographic and preoperative comorbidities. What we thought was very interesting is that neoadjuvant therapy, clamping time, pathologic vein invasion, resection margin status, uh, postoperative pancreatic fistula, and the type of anticoagulation that was used, whether it was heparin and warfarin or just antiplatelet, did not actually impact uh, and were not uh, associated with an increased risk of thrombosis. What we thought was even more interesting is that patients with sepsis had an almost 4.5 increased risk of developing a port of thrombosis after reconstruction. And we thought it was probably secondary to the pro-inflammatory state they were in and possibly local vascular compression from an intra-abdominal collection. 
uh, in summary, in this series of 220 uh, patients with pancreatectomies and portal vein resection, 16% of patients developed thrombosis postoperatively after a median time of 15 days. Reconstruction with interposition graft carries the highest risk of thrombosis. And interestingly, postoperative sepsis was an independent risk of developing portal vein thrombosis with a four to five increased risk. In conclusion, this, this series suggests that portal vein thrombosis after portal vein resection during pancreatectomy is a common complication. Primary repair should be attempted first and the use of an interposition graft should be uh, weighed against the high risk of, of postoperative portal vein thrombosis. And as the prevalence of portal vein thrombosis is significantly higher in patients with postoperative sepsis, a low threshold of suspicion should be kept even in asymptomatic patients. Once again, I apologize for the technical difficulty and thank you very much. I'd be happy to take any question. Thank you very much, Dr. Roche. Um, the discussion will be begun by uh, Dr. Merritt. All right, thank you, Dr. Roche, for your single institution review looking at the incidence and uh, risk factors for, for uh, portal vein thrombosis after pancreatic resection. Um, I do have a few questions for you based on your presentation. Uh, number one, so we, I noticed that a relatively small amount of the patients were on any sort of anticoagulation uh, therapy in the postoperative period. Did this data include patients that were on any sort of prophylactic doses of, say, heparin subcutaneously or Lovenox? And if so, um, and I should say, if not, then what was the factors other than risk of postoperative bleeding that prevented the use of these relatively commonly used medications in high-risk patients? Uh, the second question uh, deals with the prosthetic grafts. Um, nearly every single patient that got a prosthetic graft developed a thrombosis. So uh, given your group understands this, what do those patients get any different post-op management than patients that say had a less risky end-to-end -end anastomosis? Uh, thank you very much for your question. Uh, regarding the anticoagulation, it was widely widely dependent on the surgeons. And we even ask every surgeon what their preference were. And uh, some of them do actually intraoperative flushing with heparin and then do antiplatelet postoperatively. Some do anticoagulation. So it is not uh, something that is a facility uh, protocol. It's really a <laughs> wide range of, of um, use, whether it's heparin, Lovenox, warfarin, or antiplatelet. So uh, the one that were not on anticoagulation were more, li more likely to be on antiplatelets. Uh, regarding your second question and the prosthetic graft, they are treated exactly the same way. The only difference is like most of the time when it's a prosthetic graft, it would be a vascular surgeon or a transplant surgeon doing that, por that portion of the surgery and it takes longer, most likely the clamping time is longer in those patients and they're more likely to be difficult patients. So it may be just a surrogate for um, harder surgery more than the graft itself. Steve, Dr. Calry. Yes, I loved your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, there are a growing number of centers uh, in Europe, for sure, and over in the East who are using a, a, new, a new breakout technique uh, fashioned by the French. And it's the reverse parietal peritoneal flap uh, for a conduit. Uh, their motivation is that, you know, uh, even though you have your IJ taken out of your neck, you have a big cut on your neck and a longer operation and an exploration of the neck and potential complications. And then in the other problem, the failure rates of the, uh, you know, the, super, the fake graphs, as you say. So it's, I haven't done it, I'll admit that. I've been tempted a couple of times, but uh, apparently what they do is they just take a piece of parietal peritoneum early, easy to harvest, and they wrap it around it like a chest tube. They sew, sew it closed while the rest of the operation's happening. And then they have essentially any length of a conduit, which they can also sew the splenic vein into, or the IMV, whatever, into it as well. And they claim that the patency rates exceed uh, in reasonable numbers of patients over 90%. So uh, something to look up if you haven't heard about it yet. 
Um, so, so I know that I've seen it used on transplant like once or twice at IU. Yeah. And I know that Dr. House has used it once because I've taken care of one of his patients that had one. It was not during a Whipple, but it was after a trauma. And, uh, but I am not, I have not seen it firsthand. Well, thank it's you very, very interesting though. Thank you very much, Dr. Oaks.